Hey guys, welcome back to Twitchy Plays Kerbal Space Program, where finally I have made the Ike probe that I've been going on about for like ever. So what we're doing here is testing, you will see that there's a small um, fuel line on the side here, this one over here. And what I'm trying to do is feed fuel from this bottom tank up to the top tank so that we can use it as an interplanetary transfer. Well, not an interplanetary, an inter interbody transfer stage. Uh, we're going to be using it to go from Juna to Ike, hopefully dumping it in orbit of Ike. Uh, and, and getting everything going nicely. Now this probe is a very useful probe. It's got all sorts of things on there, mainly science. You'll see in the middle we have the materials bay. We've got goo canister stuck on the side and on the other side, which you cannot see, uh, we have both the multispectral scanner, the radar scanner. We also have uh, the accelerometer and the temperature probe. So all in all, we have a complete scientific package here. Uh, and it turns out that this this um, system that I'm working on here works a charm, especially when you deploy everything early and only really managed to blow up the uh, the radial Rocker Max 2477 engines on the side. And as I was saying at the time, if I had this on Ike, I would count this as a win. So the next job after the design is, of course, trying to put it in orbit with uh, the Ignis craft up here. Uh, for some reason, I decided to wait until Ignis was directly overhead to launch my launch my vessel. This obviously to everyone that knows what they're doing is far far too late but we we're going to go with it as it's already there and i'd already waited one orbit it, it was just a whole patience issue thing and as you know i don't really have much patience to have an issue with as we form the gravity turn, I think I'll go and talk about the uh, the lifting mechanism here. As you can see, it's not the most sophisticated design. Uh, we have the LFB KR1-2 on the bottom there. Turns out the most inefficient uh, engine in the game. I thought it'd be nice to put something with some oomph underneath it, but it turns out it would have been better just to put a mainsail or maybe a skipper or something like that underneath a couple of orange tanks. But the most important part of the lifting technology is I also have a probe core and uh, some SAS on top of it so that we can get it back because it's an expensive bit of equipment and I'm very quickly eating through that 1.2 mil that we had set aside for this. Uh, so we're just playing about with the maneuver nodes here, trying to get the closest approach possible. Uh, it turns out it's not this orbit, but next orbit, of course, because we were so far away. Um, though with a little bit of tweaking, we can make sure that we get a, a, an encounter exactly where we want it, as close as we want it. So everything kind of worked out all right in the end. It just took a little bit longer than I would have previously liked. So whilst we're waiting around for this all to play out, I think what we're going to do is go over to the VAB and start working on the bu Juno buggy because, you know, we need to get this up into orbit as well. So I have two jobs that I'm thinking about whilst doing this uh, little retrofit here. The first is that we need to be able to get it to dock up to the uh, the Ignis up there. So the first thing I do is attach some RCS and we're going to use the monoprop in the front port here or at least in the command center, sorry, uh, command pod. Wow, how many times can I get something wrong? Uh, well, that was my original thought and I was like, way 10 monoprop it's never going to work so i put a load of radial monoprop engines uh, not engines radial monoprop fuel tanks around the outside so that we can take them off using the attachment system now my next idea was how on earth are we going to stick some sort of decent lifter around this um and first i get out the octagonal struts just to sit not the, the the cubic strut sorry just to see where things would fit and it turns out they didn't fit anywhere either um got out the radial decouplers uh could find a spot on the very corner here so i got the cubic struts out again and just just tried to see what would work. Uh, it turns out this triple design worked really, really well, or at least it fit in the space that I had available to it. So we could just start strapping rockets around the outside. Uh, well, fuel tanks and then rockets around the outside. Of course, not forgetting all the probe bodies and stuff like that to be able to bring all this stuff back. I'm not sure if I'm losing money by doing this or making money. Uh, I, I do know that if the engines hit and explode, I end up losing money because they're, they're kind of the most ex uh, most important bit or the most expensive bit anyway. But yes, there we go. This is, this is kind of the idea that I'm thinking about. And aside from a few tweaks like putting some uh, separatrons on it and, and struts, struts of course are always ultimately important uh, but despite these few tweaks and stuff like that what we're going to do is put this on the launch pad and then go back to our probe because it's got quite a bit way around its orbit at this point of course when i say it's got around its orbit if we go to the map view we've got that far away from the uh from the maneuver node as you can tell not not quite what we were going for it's uh not not good enough really but what we're going to do is just like move the maneuver node around a bit more make sure that it was exactly where we wanted it and one of the main problems i've been having here is you can see i keep clicking uh the 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 close encounter nodes over there that's because i'm trying to get the distance uh, markers to stay up because you know when you click on it you can keep the numbers on screen well for some reason that does not want to work with any of my close encounter nodes which means I'm pretty much trying to do all these maneuvers uh, blind which is a little bit annoying 
which of course unfortunately means we miss all our earliest opportunities to get the closest approach as we go screaming past the point where it would have made the best effort to, to make our burn there. Um, we could have lifted the Juna buggy up at, during this time, but of course I would have had to wait for the Ignis to get round towards the desert again where we're looking at, uh, and by that time I could have sorted out the probe and got it done. Um, so whilst I think maybe time might be a bit of an issue, or I, I think my time is a bit of an issue, we do have 150 odd days until we need to sort out what's going on with, with all this so i'm not really that bothered about wasting time uh here i am busy making one of the biggest mistakes of this particular orbit uh so i've i've time accelerated my way around to the light side of the planet so that we can get this probe like fully powered doing what it needs to do to be able to rendezvous but of course I had the lifting mechanism behind it, um, and I'd also put a, a pro body and stuff like that on there, but the one thing I had managed to forget was to put any solar panels. So in the time it took us to come round out of the shadow of Kerbin, we'd run out of electric. You see, I've got the fuel to go back, it just I just don't have the electric, which is um, vexing, shall we say, vexing. Another problem that we're just about to encounter is where I've tried to sort everything out to make sure that I get some sort of encounter over there You can see it was a very close encounter. I've actually managed to put my periaps down below the level of the atmosphere Again a little bit annoying, but the, these things do happen. Uh, so I put I push myself out uh, radially up i.e. I just go up um, and try and make it so that my periaps is where I am at the moment so that we are traveling up out of the atmosphere the entire time which works incredibly well of course this does misalign my 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 next encounter which isn't great but we're, we're going to deal with that and hopefully in the time it takes me to come out of the atmosphere proper we can sort out these maneuver nodes to make sure we get everything lined up and, and looking beautifully uh, it was a bit of a struggle I just ended up pointing my ship in different directions giving a boost here a boost there uh, I did start off trying to use the maneuver nodes but every, everything was just well the ship was moving too quick towards the maneuver node so i knew by the time i had the maneuver node set up i would probably put, go sailing past it uh then i would mess everything up and i thought i knew where i wanted to go ish so i was going to just go go with the, my gut really uh, that, that's kind of how how i felt at the time and it worked out all right i mean we've got an encounter here of i don't know a couple of there we go six, 60 kilometers not the best so we're going to spend some more time uh, thrusting around in, in, in the atmosphere, not in the atmosphere, in orbit here. Um, basically trying to get my retrograde and, and stuff markers all lining up, the retrograde and target markers lining up so that we can get there as quick as possible. Once my map view tells me that I have an encounter less than five kilometers, I think it was like 4.2 kilometers or something like that, I decided that it was time to go back to staging view and just wait out the time like that. Yeah, 4.1 kilometer encounter, that's all good for me. Uh, I turned my vessel around to point towards my like target retrograde uh, to make sure that we can slow down our vessel as we're approaching and also give little shunts and shimmies in the right direction so we get our encounter down to, to less and less and less as we're approaching which you know is the ideal way to do these sort of things now with less than a kilometer or coming up to just less than a kilometer to go to till we have an impact i think it's time to start like nullifying our speed down to more manageable levels uh, at these sort of distances i'm calling sort of 20 30 meters per second manageable if we get less to a hundred less than 100 we want to start going down to single figure meters per second and then when we're down to less than 10 we want to be coming in at like point something per meters per second which kind of works out fine uh so the thing i just did there i was i selected the docking port i wanted to dock to as my target and also at the same time selected the docking port on the bottom of this probe as the the control point so that all i have to do is use the nav ball to fly around and make sure that i'm kind of pointed right at it. well i say kind of i am pointed exactly right at it um and then we're just going to float in nice and slow and serene uh, i'm glad that i've managed to speed this a uh, bit of footage up here um my fear of smashing in and blowing everything up to bits really did mean that I was coming in slow you can see here I'm going in at 0 0.2 meters per second um, very very shy about this uh, but we let the magnetics take hold um, and with a little tweak of the RCS every now and then managed to get perfectly docked and look at that doesn't that not look sticky out at all yeah great <laughs> <laughs> 
So with such the bad rendezvous, obviously I've used up a bit more fuel than I need to, so we're going to transfer it from the big tank, because it's easier just to transfer everything into one tank when we come for a refuel mission, not to spoil the later bit in the episode at all. Okay, so there's one more vessel to put up before the Ignis can be called complete, and that is, of course, the Juno buggy, the one we're going to be using to dra drag around our glider. Uh, you will remember this from earlier on in the episode, we put this together, we stuck all these rent engines and fuel tanks and stuff around the outside of the Juno buggy. You can just about make it out in the middle there. Uh, I kind of wish I'd put a load of lights on this, thinking about it. It would be nice to light up the, the internals here. But, you know, th this is the way it goes sometimes. So coming up on our 10km gravity turn, learn, leaning over quite early this time because I wanted to deal, uh, get rid of those solid boosters after the turn. So we, we did it that way. I, I could have done it before the turn, I suppose. But, you know, that, that's the way things go here. Breaking out of the atmosphere. And I'm about to do um, something that I, I don't actually managed to do all that often here we're, 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 we're climbing up and trying to get our apple apps up to the same um same height as the the ignis here we're going to make it up to about 100 kilometers i believe it was um coming through do it doing our, our standard lifting stuff here you know pointing at 45 degrees and look how close that encounter is this is literally a first for me um it was quite exciting i've got to say I, I've, I've never had a lift go straight up and touch the touch a vehicle like that uh indeed you can see it even in the background there which uh, to me is amazing uh so i have disregarded all orbital numbers at this point you can you can see down there i'm on my targeting and we're just going to fire up like this i mean just just look how close that was that was like less than six kilometer distance when when we were at the closest point if i if i'd managed to fire my engines just i don't know 10, 10 seconds beforehand, probably not even that many seconds beforehand. We would have had um, like a perfect encounter there. Um, so yeah, that, that would have been great. It, it didn't quite work out like that, but 14 kilometers away, I think are fine. Uh, so fine that we spin the, the, the vessel round to get rid of all the, uh, the boosting mechanisms. I don't know why I keep calling them mechanisms. They are just like lift rockets, I suppose. But, you know, that, that's the way my language works at the moment. And we're going to make it so our targeting reticule is over the top of our target reticule. Yeah, that, that, those are the, the, the things I just said. And we're trying to get the, the closest encounter we can at the shortest distance we can, which turns out is just over there at about six kilometers. Hopefully this display of uh, rendezvous excellence makes up for the uh, very poor lift that I did beforehand. Hopefully. I'm a good player, really. <laughs> so after waiting some time for our orbits to line up, we get to this position here where we are within the physics boundary of 2.5 kilometers. And using the same technique that I used for the probe to, to push myself in, in closer, every time I slow down, I go beyond my retrograde uh, reticule and try and push it over the top of the pink one uh, so that makes sure that i'm flying or well, falling straight towards the target which which is kind of what we're after obviously we, we want to pretty much put in a collision course i mean with, with just using these rcs thrusters we don't we don't want to be coming in too heavy um else that would be quite a quite a mess to deal with to be honest it's the one thing that i haven't actually done in this whole process here is smash anything into it like so hard that everything explodes which i i kind of feel a little bit proud about you know I, th there was more than enough opportunity here for things to explode uh, and as it goes there still is a lot of opportunity for things to explode there are various list lifting units and stuff that are in orbit around the same sort of height as, as ignis here which means we have one more flight to do before we actually send this off to Juna. Um, not only do we have to come up and refuel all the, the, the monoprop and the liquid fuel that we used on the Ike probe to get it in here, uh, we also need to attach some struts, some of the, the, the Kerbal attachment struts, because as you can see, a few of these things that are sticking out are, are quite wobbly, especially when I try and turn the craft around its axis, that, that definitely um, induces some wobble. But, you know, th these are all things to be done for a later mission. Right now, we have once again targeted the docking port on the on the Ignis that I'm aiming for, opened up the, the closed hatch on the back of the Juno buggy, and are now flying in at the slowest of speeds, half a meter per second, trying to get lined up and make sure that the, the two docking ports mate up appropriately. If I had a little bit more, I'm not, not going to say experience, but a little bit more confidence in what I was doing here, I could probably have screamed in at a few more meters per second and made sure everything happened a little bit quicker. 
But I, it wasn't that I, I, I didn't have the confidence. I just didn't want to break everything and then have to launch everything back into orbit. Like, we, we don't really have a safe state that we can go back to if everything goes completely wrong. So what I'm having trouble here is getting totally lined up. Every time I get close enough, I kind of bounce off of stuff and then um, go, go spinning away a little bit. But if we just feather the, uh, the RCS here a little bit, not the RCS, the SAS, we get joined. Yay! We could technically call the Ignis complete at this point, but I've, we've got a few things to deal with. First, we need to deorbit things like this. Now, one of the things that I didn't take into account whilst doing this was the fact that the parachutes and the decouplers weigh different amounts. So uh, when, when I fire up this engine here, you'll see that I'm slowly spinning out of control and it takes me a little while to actually figure out why. I'm like, is my SAS on? Am I, am I pushing stuff? Do we have this control issue again? Um, but I do eventually figure out what's going on, start spinning the ship around to try and get it's it's um, it's lean to keep coming back to the same spot, but that that doesn't really work. So what we're going to do is just wait until the vessel is pointed in roughly the right direction, and then start hitting uh, go. Which, as you could have seen from that map view, there was not the most efficient way of doing it. But given the situation we found ourselves in, it seemed to work quite well. Uh, once again, we have the parachute issue here. Despite having two parachutes on the bottom and one on the top, turns out that that's not balanced at all. Can't even use the engine to try and help stuff out. Lost the probe core, lost the top tank, and unfortunately, lost the probe core whilst my engine was throttled up. So we've now got to wait for all this fuel to burn out before we can recover it. And of course, repeating that action two more times will just clean up, well, not all the, the space debris, but we'll clean up all the Juna buggy space debris uh, and put that back down close to us. Sometimes we get quite close, sometimes we get quite far, or once we get close and once we get quite far. And it really does show on the recovery cost of how much that, that actually is. Unfortunately, looking at the episode marker here, I have run out of time to tell you about all the other wonderful things that happened in this. Uh, one thing that we will just have in the background whilst I say goodbye is the realignment of the wings. Um, Alex actually told me that if I come away a little bit and then save and reload, the magnetics will realign themselves and I can pull myself back in without actually having to go so far away. So thank you very much for that, Alex. And I will say to everyone else, thank you very much for joining me for this adventure. I will see you next time when we're going to complete the refueling, add some more struts, and then get on our way, finally. I'm, I'm sorry this is taking so long, guys. It's been like three episodes so far. But we will finally get on our way to Juno. I will see you then when we're going to do that. Bye!